Hey guys, welcome to the first animation tutorial. Uh, there's going to be two of these and this is the first one. You will find this scene. This scene has a ball with a little swirly sort of blue texture, a floor that doesn't have a texture, and two lights. And um, you'll find this in a project folder on the server called Bouncing Ball Tutorials. So that's where you can find this to follow along. Um, and we're going to do two different bouncing balls. This first one is going to be just this ball bouncing up and down on a loop. It's going to be kind of like the ball is actually jumping up and down of its own power. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about things like how to make sure that your animation is, your characters and your objects have weight and that, you know, the effect of gravity is visible because that's really the biggest thing of anything about animation is you have to make sure that whatever it is that you're trying to move around that it looks like it's being affected by gravity because if it doesn't it's not going to look realistic or be believable and it's not going to be good um, because we can never get away from gravity obviously it's a, a constant and so we're always working against it when trying to create movement and we have to do that in our animation as well so that's kind of the biggest thing that we'll think about with these projects so, but this one is just going to be a ball bouncing up and down. So, the first thing I'm going to do is I am going to make this four seconds long. So, I'm going to come down here where it has this little number here with this 120. This is the current length of the timeline. Just going to put in 96. And actually, I'm going to make the project, the whole project, be 96 frames as well. So, we've got four seconds that we're going to work with and this ball is going to bounce up and down four times, so basically once a second. So if you select this, you can see that we have everything is all set to zero. I've frozen the transformations and everything right here. And um, I'm just going to start putting in some keyframes in the y-axis. That's where the movement is going to happen, is obviously up and down like this. So I'm going to start here at frame one, and in the translate Y, I'm just gonna set a keyframe right there. I like to set keyframes just by, you know, ch one channel at a time. I feel like it's a more sort of efficient way to work. You don't have a lot of extra keyframes that you don't need. Some people will keyframe things by pushing the letter S. That keyframes everything. And so all the channels get keyed every time you click S. Um, some people like to work like that, and that's fine if you do. You can try it out, whatever you want. Um, I prefer to be more precise. Also, some people will turn on auto key, which I believe is down here, uh, one of these, or it's somewhere in here. There's a place to turn on auto key, and you can find where that is. And when, when that happens, when you use that function, um, anytime you move something, a keyframe just automatically gets set. Um, and that, some people like to work that way too. They feel like it's more efficient and it's easier and they don't have to keep going and setting keyframes. I feel like I don't have a lot of control about what's happening to my stuff when I do that. So again, I prefer to just decide what I'm moving, move it, and set the keyframe on that channel. Um, but it's completely up to you however you want to work. That's your, your decision as the artist. So I've set a keyframe here on the first uh, key. I'm going to go down to 24 because, and what I'm doing at this time is I'm just putting in all of my low keyframes. These are the keyframes where the ball is going to be on the ground. It's going to be hitting the ground. Um, so I'll go to 24 and I'll just set another keyframe in the translate Y. So we don't have any actual movement yet. If I play this, nothing's really happening even between the keyframes because like we're not doing anything yet. There's no movement yet. But I'm just putting in the basic, the basic movements right now. So we're going to go to 24, up to 48. The other thing that you can do is you can right click and copy this keyframe if you want. And then come down to 72 and paste that in. That's another way to put in keyframes. And then I'll just do the same thing down here on frame 96. So now I have all my low frames in, and what I'll do is I'll come back to frame 12, and this is going to be uh, one of the high frames. This is going to be sort of the top of the bounce that I'm going to put in now. 
and you can pull this up to wherever you want, however high you want it to be. I'm actually just going to enter the number 8 right here, just because it's easier and it's an even number and whatever, you know, so that's fine. And then I will set this keyframe as well. And now if I play this, you can see that I'm starting to get movement. So then I'll just take this keyframe on number 12 and I'm going to copy it. And then I'll paste it on 36. On 60. And 84. All right. So basically we have, that didn't really work. Let's see why. What's going on? Hmm. Well, anyway, that's, things like that happen. Obviously, you guys worked with Maya enough to know that Maya just goes, meh, no thanks. So you can come along and just make sure it gets corrected. It's easy that I just chose an even number too, so I don't have to think about what that number is supposed to be. And you guys probably noticed that it wasn't actually high and you were thinking the whole time, it's not working. Go back and look. So, yeah, now we've got some movement happening. It's not very good movement. It's not very believable. It's very mechanical and sort of even up and down. But it's a start. It's our main keyframes. These are going to be our main keyframes for the whole animation and everything else we do is going to be based off of these. So, the next thing that we need to do is we need to start trying to make this feel more like it's realistic, like it's actually bouncing off of the ground. And the way that we do that is it's a, pro it's a technique called slowing in and out. It's one of your 12 principles of animation. And what it means is that we have to make sure that our ball is slowing down as it reaches the top of the bounce and then speeding up as it hits the ground. Because that's really how it would work. The ball is going to bounce against the ground and fly up in the air and it's going to start to slow down as gravity takes hold of it and then it's going to start pulling it down faster and, and the fastest it'll be right before it hits the ground and then it's going to bounce off really fast and then as it goes up in the air again it's going to slow down again. So and there's actually a really easy way to do that in Maya it's called the graph editor um, and let me just open it up here for you if you go to Windows animation editors graph editor and they've actually redone a lot of stuff with this so it's actually really good and easy to use nowadays so this will be your graph editor and what this is is just a graph between your keyframes that describes the interpolation between the keyframes that's a, a weird animation word that you don't need to be intimidated by um, what it just means is how the object is moving between the keyframes, like how fast is it and when does it slow down and how does the movement go. That's what interpolation means. And that's what this graph uh, shows a visual representation of. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that here at the bottom, we've got this sort of round kind of curve happening at the bottom. And that's not very realistic. That's making it sort of slow down and then speed back up. And that's not what would happen on a bounce. So what we can do is take all these keyframes and we are going to make them a different type of keyframe. If you come up here to tangents, all these little lines here, these handles, you can actually use these to just change how the ball is. If I were to take my, my cursor down here and just grab this and move it, you can see that changes where the ball is in relation to where we've started. So that you can do that at the end if you want. And you probably will have to at some point. But I'm going to take these and I'm going to change the type of tangents that these are. These are all spline tangents right now. If I look up in here, I'll just tear this off. These are spline tangents. That's the default. It, what it does is it just tries to make an even transition uh, between the keyframes. That's what a spline tangent does. We are going to make these tangents linear, and that's going to make them be pointed at the bottom. And what's going to happen just doing that, let me actually just see if I can dock this here and rearrange this a little. There we go. Uh, 
I don't know if this is going to work. Let's see. Yeah, close enough. So when I play this, you can already see that bounce at the bottom is a lot faster just because I made these linear tangents. So now the other thing that we need to do is we need to kind of even out this arc because do you see how this one is not quite as, it's a little more narrow than the others and we kind of want it to be even. So I'm going to take this keyframe and I'm just going to pull on this tangent a little. You can actually hold down shift if you want it to be really straight and just try to make it the same as the others. And then what you can do is select all of them and pull one. Well, I guess you, if you select, oh, well, that's a difference. Okay. Well, you might have to do it one at a time, but if you just spread this out a little bit more, that will make the ball hang in the air a little bit longer. And that's going to be that slowing in and out process that I talked about, where it's just going to make it feel a little more like that the ball is being affected by gravity. That might be a little too far. That's the other thing that you have to do when you're doing animation is that you have to set your keyframes and then test it and decide if it's good and then go back and do some more tweaking. That's the thing that makes animation sort of tedious and, you know, difficult and a thing that maybe not everyone can do because it is, you have to really like just over and over go through the same keyframes and do little tweaks to just make sure that you like how it is. So that's probably okay. I think I'm going to actually make them a little bit less, just a little bit. And then with these tangents, they're still kind of a little, a little curve that I don't like. So I'm going to take all these tangents and I'm actually just going to break them. And what that means is I'm going to make it so if I select this and move it, it only affects one side and not both sides. Because right now when you move it, it affects both sides. So I'm going to break these tangents so they can be independent from one side to the other. So I'll just select them all. I'm going to click this icon right here, which is the break tangents icon. And now I can select a tangent and just sort of lift that up a little. I'll probably have to readjust that again, but just make this a little more of a sharp kind of a bounce. Because that's going to make it more realistic. And then take these and maybe pull them back in a little. The other thing that you can do is when you're working in the graph editor, like no one's ever really going to see the graph editor, but if you are creating animation or if you're doing a pattern like this, if it's nice and even and it looks, you know, symmetrical and, and even and, and a good pattern, then you're, that's how your movement is going to be. It's going to be nice and symmetrical and in a good pattern. So even though no one ever actually sees this line, if you make this line look as good as you can, your movement is going to be as good as you can make it. So let's see how this goes. Right, so I think I could probably just tighten this up a little bit more. That's probably good enough for now. So then what you'd want to do is you'd want to save, obviously, at this point, because you have something that you don't want to have to, if you lose, you have to go back and redo it. So I'm just going to save, always save with save as. I'm going to save this as bouncing ball test one. Again, never save over the same file. Um, in case something bad happens. So now we have the movement and it's fairly believable, you know, 
but we can add to it and make it even more believable. And that's another of your principles of animation, which is uh, squash and stretch. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this graph editor right now because I don't really need that right now. Um, squash and stretch is a thing that happens where the whatever it is that's moving, the ball or the character or the object, will deform between the keyframes. And um, you, there's a lot of reasons that you might want to do that. It can indicate sort of the material that the object is made out of. It can sort of in, you know, emphasize the speed of the movement or anything like that. Impact, it shows impact. So there's a lot of reasons that you would want to squash and stretch your ball. So I'm going to start here at the beginning. What I'm going to use, and I'm going to actually do this in one of our orthographic views here. Let me just get a reasonable... And I'll put this on wireframe so it's easier to see. So here's our ball, and I am going to use what's called a squash deformer. So if I go up to deform, actually, I mean, you can find it in modeling too. There's deform, go down to nonlinear, and I am going to use the squash deformer. There's all these different other deformers that you can use. I definitely recommend that you try these out. You can use the bend to bend anything. You can make candy canes or anything like that. The twist, you can twist things around. Um, so you can make things like Twizzlers or whatever. Um, and a bunch of other things too. So I'm going to use the squash. And basically, I'll put the squash handle in. And then if you hit T, no, it's, it's Y, I think. Which one is it? Is it T? Yeah, it's T, where you start to get this little handle. And then if I pull on this one, you can see that it squashes and stretches the ball, however you want. Now what we need is that we actually need the squash to happen from the bottom of this ball. So I am going to get the move tool. I'm going to bring this down so that it's even with the bottom of the ball. And then I'm going to scale it up so that the squash handle goes above the ball. So it squashes it nice and evenly. And then if I hit T again, you can see that my squash handle will actually squash it down against the ground. See how it's a little more flat on the bottom and a little rounder on the top? That's going to make it look a lot more realistic when it's squashing against the ground. So, And then if you want to actually put in numbers for this squash factor, you can have it selected go over to inputs in your channel box and you've got your squash handle and then you set the factor back to zero. One thing to remember too is that if you put a negative number in here it will squash. Positive numbers will stretch the ball out. So that's how that's going to work. But I'll put this back to zero. Now the other thing that you want to do is you want to make sure that this squash handle stays with your ball. Because when I move this you can see that the ball is the, the the squash handle is not following the ball and you want it to stay with it all the time. So you want to make sure that you parent it to the ball. So I have the squash handle selected. I'm going to shift select the ball and I'm going to hit P. And now when I select the ball, that squash handle will move with it. If I play this animation, now the squash handle moves with the ball. That's what you want. So now let me zoom this out a little so we can see better. There's our lights there at the top which we won't really need to worry about until we're rendering. So this is my bounce that I have with no squash and stretch. So now what I need to do is I need to start setting keyframes on this squash factor. And I'm going to start out with on my high frames because I don't want any squash and stretch at all on my high frames. I want to make sure that it's a perfect circle just like this. So on my high frames, I'm going to set the squash factor to zero and just key it there. That's going to be 12, 36, 60, 84. All right, so I've got my high frames done. Now let me go ahead and start with my squash, which is going to be at the bottom where it hits the ground. Let me see what it looks like if I put a negative 5 in the squash. Oh, that's a lot. So let's try negative 0.5. That's a lot better. 
yeah, that's probably what I'll use. I'll go ahead and do negative 0.5 on all of my low frames for my squash factor. So I'll just go ahead and do that now. I'll come down to 24, put in negative 0.5. That's, see, now I'm just not paying attention. See, you got to make sure you type stuff right if you want it to work. All right. Just make sure I've got it so far. This goes back to normal squash, back to regular squash again, back up to normal. I need to squash this one, negative 0.5. Key it. Don't forget to set your keyframes too. I do that a lot. I'll change a value and then forget to set it and then it doesn't work and I'm like, what's happening? So you want to avoid that when you can. And then the last one, negative 0.5. And now you can see I have it squashing down, but it doesn't look very good really just because it doesn't really make any sense. And the reason why is because you have to have the stretch as well. Um, so right before and right after the squash, you need to stretch it and that's going to make it look even faster. Remember how we talked about that the ball is going to go faster as it goes towards the ground and right after it leaves because of the bounce? That stretch is going to help sell that effect. So we've got to put the stretch in there. So let me go up to maybe frame two. Yeah, go with frame two. And we're going to put in a positive 0.5 in the factor. So that's a little bit of a stretch right there. So now it starts out flat. You know what? Let me move this to frame three. I'm going to cut that keyframe and put it on frame three. And we'll see if that works better. I feel like it might. So we start out flat, like it's squashed, and then it stretches, and then it goes back to normal. And that is what we're looking for in terms of the squash and stretch, where it starts out flat. And then it stretches out as, as it's going fast. And then as it starts to slow down, it goes back to its normal shape. So we'll just go a couple frames on each side of our low frames. And we'll put in a positive 0.5 in the factor. So, and I'm actually just going to copy and paste these. So I'll copy that keyframe there. I'll go to 22, paste it in. 26, paste that in. We'll come down to 46 and paste it, 50, uh, 70, and 74, and 94. All right, so let's see where we are. We'll just play this through. And that's sort of what we're looking for. Not exactly. One thing I'm going to check too is I'm going to make sure that this timeline is playing in real time. Because sometimes if it isn't, if it's just calculating one frame to the next, it's not going to be the right speed. So I'm just going to go here where it says playback speed. What I've done is just right clicked in the timeline and opened up this marking menu. And then it's saying play every frame max real time. Now that's good if you're working with dynamics or whatever, where you have to calculate one frame to the next, but I'm just going to change it to just real time right here. Just make sure that changed for me. And now when I play this, it's going to be the actual speed of how we would render it. So it still looks kind of weird. And the reason why is this. You have to also pay attention to where the mass of the ball is. See how it's a little bit wider at the top and a little bit more narrow at the bottom? That is because the mass of the ball is leading the movement. And that looks correct. But then what happens when it starts to go down is that the mass is trailing the ball. And that's not what we want. So what we're going to have to do is set some keyframes on the actual 
translate Y of the squash handle. Just going to hit. That's fine. So we're going to have to set some keyframes on the squash handle as well. So, and when we do this, we're going to lose our keyframes, the visual, the, because those are actually on our ball, and we're going to set keyframes on the squash handle now. So you have to remember what your keyframes were. It might be a good idea to come back here and write down all of these keyframes just to make sure that you know what they are. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and start setting some keyframes on this. So we want the middle of the squash handle to be at the bottom of the ball on all of the low frames. So I'm going to go ahead and set a keyframe right there on all my low frames. I do remember my low frames were every second, so every 24 frames. So I'm going to go to 24 and I'll set that uh, 48 and I'll set it there. 72 and 96. Right, so that makes sure that squash handle is in the right place for all of our low frames. Because again, we want it to bounce against the ground and squash out against the ground. And making sure that the middle of the squash handle is at the bottom of the ball is going to help us do that. So then on our stretches, it doesn't actually really matter on the high frames where this squash handle is because it's not squashing anything. But we want to make sure that on our stretch frames that if it's if it's on a stretch that's going towards the top, it's just like this, like before. So I'll key that there. But if it is on a stretch frame that is going towards the ground, we need to move this so that it is at the top of the ball. So let me just show you what that's going to look like on this first second. It's going to stretch upwards, go back to normal, and then stretch downwards and bounce against the ground. And that's what you're looking for. That's what you have to make sure that you do. And that's why we're moving the translate Y on this squash handle. So let me just do that again. We're going to make sure that this is where it's supposed to be. I'll go ahead and key it just to make sure that it's there. Then when we come down to this one, I'm going to move this so that it's squashing down. Let me just make sure again that we've got that right. Yeah, it doesn't really matter at the top. It matters right before and right after each bounce. So that's got to be pinned right there. And we'll come down here. Move this because this is right before the bounce. So it's going down. And then this one is where it should be. So we'll key it there. And then 94 is going back down again. So we'll move this back up. And you can actually go and find a number and enter that if you want to, or you can just move it with the squat with the move tool. It doesn't really matter. But now, if I show this, it's going to be a little bit more realistic now. Let me go ahead and I'll actually hide this squash handle just so we can see better what the ball looks like. It's kind of squashed against the ground. It's when it starts. It's a little bit fast at the bottom. So what you could do if you wanted, it would be a little bit tricky, but we could do it. Let's see. I mean, at this point, it's up to you. It's up to you going back and making adjustments to make it go a little bit faster or slower or higher or lower or whatever you want. You're fine tuning at this point. You have all the keyframes set that you need. Um, and then it's just doing all the tweaking now at this point. So what I might do is I'm going to come up here to Window, Animation Editors, Graph Editor. And then you can see on this side I've got a lot of different things in my Graph Editor now. I've got the Translate Y, which we were working with on my sphere. And I also have the squash factor of my um, 
squash handle. And then I also have the translate Y on the squash handle right there. So what I might do is just select all this so I can see all the keyframes. And so you can see that these are my stretch frames right here, right? The ones that are just before and just after my low frame. So if I want that bounce at the bottom to be a tiny bit slower, what I can do is I can select all those, all those keyframes in the graph editor and just, just move them a little bit away. Make sure you have the move tool on to do this and just move them a little and usually it will snap between keyframes. So if you just want to do one keyframe, just scoot it one keyframe. Maybe scoot this one back a keyframe. Make sure that you have everything selected that you want. And then scoot it back. Take this one and scoot it forward. Oops. And now I'm just making that squash last a tiny bit longer, just a frame longer on each side. And we're going to see what that looks like. It might make it look a little bit better when it's bouncing at the bottom. That's my hope. That's why I'm doing this. All right, I'll minimize that and then we'll see what that's done. And I feel like I'm happy with this. Let me go ahead and stop this. I'll, oops, select my floor there. I'll hide my squash handle. I'm okay with this for a bounce for right now. Now, the other thing that you want to do is you want to create it, an output for this because, you know, you don't want to just turn in your scene with keyframes in it. I need you to produce something. And we're going to talk about rendering image sequences in another video. But for now, if you want to just take a preview of this screen that you have right here, um, that's a really easy thing to do. So um, if you just right click here, you're going to do what's called a play blast. So you go up to your play blast options and these are how you can set it up. And once you set all your parameters up here and you play blast this, then Maya will just go through all the keyframes and just make a little video just showing this screen right here, this preview viewport without any sort of whatever you see here is just what you'll have. So there won't be like lighting or anything like that. That's got to be calculated by the renderer. You'll just see this screen played in a video. So what I'll do is I'll want to do an AVI. You can do an image sequence, which we'll talk about later if you want to, but AVIs will be fine. And then I'm going to turn the quality all the way up and the scale all the way up, just so you have a nice quality. So it looks like this. If you turn the quality down, you'll start, to, it'll be more pixely. If you turn the size down, that'll be even more pixely. Um, frame padding doesn't matter. And then I'm going to click where it says save to file right here. And this is where I am going to choose to save this little video that I'm going to make somewhere. So I'm going to click browse and see how it goes right to your movies folder of your text of your, your bouncing ball project. If you've set your project, that's what will happen automatically. If not, you need to navigate to that. You want to put your play blast in the movies folder of your project. So play blasts go in the movies folder. Scenes go in the scenes, images go in images, textures go in source images. That's that's the organization that you're always keeping up all the time. Uh, these videos will go in the movies folder. So I'm going to just call this ball play blast. And sometimes I use this camel case where you have a capital letter in the middle like that. It's just easy to use sometimes. You don't have to, but that's just sometimes how I type things. So I'm going to go ahead and save that and then click this play blast button and it's going to go through the whole timeline 
and then theoretically it should open that video and play it for us with the media player. If not, you can actually just go out and find it in your movies folder and there it is right there. So we can actually just play this right now. I'm going to use VLC and there is a play blast of our bouncing ball. Now what you can do if you want let me play let me play this on something else. Let me play it on Windows Media Player and turn it on so that it plays on a loop. See how it has kind of a little hiccup when it starts and stops? One thing that you can do if you want it to play on a loop is instead of going all the way to 96, just do up to 95. And that way that last sort of bounce gets it doesn't get repeated again on frame one it just gets substituted so you see what I mean so it goes all the way up to 95 and then it starts at one it's a way to sort of get rid of that hiccup so let me just replay blast that I'll just go and I'll, I'll just save over the same one and play blast it And then if I open that in the media player, then it's still a little bit weird. And it's something that you can sort of adjust and work with. But essentially, that's the first bouncing ball project. And again, we're going to do a separate video talking about rendering because there is lighting in here and things. And um, you want to be able to produce that as well. You want to make sure that you can have your texture show up and all of your like refractions and all of that. Um, but that's going to be for a different video. But for now, this is all you need to do uh, to finish this off. You will eventually have to render this. But um, I would like to see a play blast as well in your movies folder when you turn this in. Because that's a really useful thing to know how to do too. So that is the end of this video. And um, st stay tuned for the next one.